Welcome back. Paul Batista, a good friend of mine who is also a researcher in this kind of thing, um, asked me to have a look at uh, this video from around 40 minutes onwards. I found the spot. It's called um, TSC, which is, um, I believe, the Science of Consciousness 2022 Plenary for Altered States of Consciousness um, forum or presentation. Uh, and it's by Charlotte Martial, who is a neuropsychologist and PhD. And he asked me to have a look at um, from this timestamp onwards because they talk about the near death experience. So uh, I'm going to have a look and let you know what I think. So hi everybody, I'm sad not being uh, not be with you today, but uh, still glad to uh, to present my favorite uh, research uh, topic, which is near death experience. So here I will uh, briefly uh, introduce our recent study about NDE and uh, briefly discuss how NDE as a state of disconnected disconnected consciousness may expand our uh, understanding of uh, human consciousness. So before to start, I will uh, quickly introduce our team. So I'm part of uh, the Coma Science Group, directed by uh, Dr. Olivia Gosri and Dr. Uh, clinician and be an engineer working on consciousness and more uh, particularly on disorder of consciousness. So our aim is uh, to improve medical care of patients with disorder of consciousness. Um, but we also work on uh, other topics such as uh, hypnosis, meditation, trance and uh, near death experience. So currently, there is uh, no common definition uh, for NDE. However, we can, uh, in research, use a scale in order to identify and characterize uh, NDE. So we recently developed a new uh, standardized scale called the Near-Death Experience Content Scale with uh, my colleagues in order to uh, better characterize NDE and uh, facilitate empirical research. Um, while there are many definitions, I can here define NDE as a profound psychological event with a, a prototypical mystical element feature typically occurring to people close to death. To give you an idea of... Uh, it says there, or in situations of intense physical or emotional danger, um, which is often called the fear-death experience. So these experiences can take place when we um, are, as it says, in intense physical or emotional danger, even if we are just, if we are afraid we're about to die, if, say, we're falling off a cliff, um, but there's no damage to the brain or we're not physically near death, but we believe we're about to be, that can also trigger a near death experience. So that's what that means. Uh, incidents, 23% of cardiac survivors, cardiac arrest survivors. So it's considerably more common in cardiac arrest survivors, which could bring about the argument that it will be some form of physical causation um, caused by the heart stopping. So lack of oxygen, lack of blood to the brain or various things like that. But again, um, that then brings into question the non-life-threatening near-death experiences that also take place and when the body is in perfectly good condition. It is interesting though that um, only three and five percent, um, only three and five percent of the, uh, three percent of traumatic brain injury survivors and five percent of the general population have them in compare or report them in comparison to the cardiac arrest survivors. Although it depends, I suppose, on on the number of people of each category that do end up talking about it um, as well as other factors I'm sure but it does bring into question why more cardiac arrest survivors than the others if they're all technically you know near death in whatever reason you question why what is the trigger in cardiac arrest survivors that isn't present in the others that can that can trigger near-death experiences so um, it'd be interesting to see what she says uh, the, the, the incidence of NDE, here are a few numbers, so we can see that about 20% of cardiac arrest survivors may report a typical uh, NDE, 
3% of TBI survival and more generally in the general population, uh, a few studies found that about 5% of the general population may report uh, NDE. So the particularity of NDE is that they contain a prototypical feature such as the, the very famous out-of-body experience, seeing a bright light at the end of a tunnel, for example, and there are other kinds of uh, prototypical features that can be identified with uh, uh, the near-death experience. So we're going to assume this is going to be focused on the subjective part of the near-death experience as opposed to the more objective veridical perception, which um, it kind of defies all attempts to explain in, in physical terms because even with a perfectly working normal physical brain some of the perceptions that take place shouldn't be possible um, just based on where the person is in relation to what they see and what they hear and their states of their brains at the time contact scale or uh, the scale developed by professor grayson uh, the near-death experience scale So it's actually in the, in 1975 that uh, the terminology Let's, of... Uh, Let's skip through the history because we know basically the history of it. Uh, I've got some books here. Uh, I don't see, I don't see um, The Self Does Not Die, which is unfortunate because I think that's probably the most important publication on the subject, um, which include third-party veridical cases, which are, in my opinion, the most important cases. Proof of Heaven, of course, Heaven Alexander, that would be there. That's probably the most popular. The Handbook of Near-Death Experiences is a very good one, very important, um, by uh, Jan Holden and, and other members of IANS. Uh, the Wisdom of Near-Death Experiences, Penny Sartori, that kind of outlines her study, which is which was a, a prospective study. Uh, I know of Beyond Consciousness Beyond Life, but I've never read it. Evidence of the Afterlife is very good by um, Dr... Um, Jeffrey Long of, of the Need Experience Research Foundation. The others I'm not overly familiar with, but I would have liked to have seen um, The Self Does Not Die by Rivas, Dervin and Smith on there. However, if we have a look to, uh, if, we, if we have a look at the research on NDE, it is actually quite limited. So we can find today 366 publications on PubMed. However, um, we can see that for the last 10 years, there is an increase of interest on nervous experience. So by contrast to uh, typical nervous experience, actually a lot of people may report a similar phenomenology memory in non-life-threatening situation. So this raises the question of, um, again, why cardiac arrest survivors report a higher case um, and the question of whether it is therefore a relation to lack of oxygen in the brain, lack of blood to the brain and, and damage that occurs as a result of um, cardiac arrest that may not exist in the other forms of, of life-threatening situation. But with this, we can see that... Um, the content of near-death experiences is very similar between those that are triggered by life-threatening situations or non-life-threatening -life situations. Um, as she listed on the left there, anxiety, fever, psychedelic drugs, syncope, which is fainting, and meditation. You could argue that we're certainly not in, in the same level of distress in, in terms of the level of oxygen to our brain or level of blood to our brain as we would be in, in um, cardiac arrests as we would be in anxiety or meditation or syncope or you know non-life-threatening seizure or even psychedelic drugs that don't exactly um, remove the oxygen from our brain at least to the same level. Maybe in meditation we are so relaxed that we breathe more slowly and don't receive as much. Um, maybe in syncope, I know that syncope is, is generally triggered by um, a lower blood pressure, especially in vasovagal responses, which I get with uh, blood tests and things like that. And in anxiety, you hyperventilate, so you'd argue you get more blood to the brain, uh, more oxygen to the brain, regardless of less. And yet, near-death experiences are still reported. And we can see from the graph on the on the right, so the red lines um, are the life-threatening near-death experiences, so in cardiac arrest, in um, other forms of, of near-death 
actual physical near-death states and the blue line is is examples of what's on the left there the non-life-threatening situations that still result in near-death like experiences we can't say near-death because they're not near-death but similar or well as we can see very similar phenomenology um so the most frequently reported and it seems in both is the peacefulness um, and then if we go down we see that the incidence of each seems to be following the same pattern of decreasing frequency regardless of whether it's life-threatening or not so peacefulness out of body experience bright light all the way down to extrasensory perception precognitive visions and um, life review and again they follow the same pattern there are some where uh, there are considerably more instances during life-threatening than non-life-threatening so out of body experiences um in fact is that i oh know and understanding and the last two precognitive and life review you generally see more of those in life-threatening situations than non-life-threatening however we do see the vice versa as well uh, more bright lights more altered perceptions of time um synchron is that synchronicity i can't read it oh harmony unity um heightened uh is it, i can't read it heightened senses something like that and presence are seen more in non-life-threatening situations however they are generally very 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 similar and the differences are, are almost really negligible compared to the trend of the actual experience itself in both if that makes sense so it's very interesting that these near-death experiences are so similar regardless of whether we're physically near death or not as it as it would be we call them near death like experience. So this experience may occur in the context of, uh, for example, or meditation or uh, while taking drugs. So the, this experience raise a puzzling question regarding the, the, the importance of life threatening uh, context context for uh, the occurrence of uh, NDE. So quickly here you can see a graph where we compare classical NDE, so inside a context of a life-threatening situation, in comparison to non-life-threatening situations, so NDE-like, and actually we did not find a significant uh, difference between uh, the uh, all uh, feature, prototypical feature of classical NDE. So this is one publication, but uh, other uh, publication show the same uh, result. So recently we've all... So this is um, Charlotte Martial's famous, or most famous, I suppose, study recently, which is a semantic analysis between um, drug-induced experiences and near-death experiences which a semantic um, examination is effectively where the researchers compare the language used to describe drug-induced experiences and near-death experiences um, and compare them to discern the similarities between them that way it's a form of content analysis uh, as opposed to a, a kind of a direct experience which of course you can't really have so it's it's really second best but it's as good as you can get with these kind of um, social science subjects and subjective science subjects. Colleague, we also wanted to compare classical NDE with a drug-induced psychedel psychedelic experience. So uh, we took uh, about 600 uh, NDE written reports and we also took a written report of a drug-induced experience here we include uh, 165, if I remember correctly, uh, substance, different substance, and we use a natural language processing in order to uh, study semantic similarity between ND report and uh, drug uh, reports. So we had many many results, but uh, most uh, the most important finding is that uh, we found that ketamine that you can see here was actually the most similar uh, phenomenological experience in comparison 
to uh, all other kind of drug experience that we uh, include in this study. So the argument you can make here is that ketamine is responsible for near-death experiences or more likely to be responsible. Um, there are very strong similarities, as Charlotte says, um, amongst the semantic analysis they did. Um, however, there are, of course, not perfect um, similarities and differences with near-death experience and ketamine trips generally. Um, and I don't know if there's been really reports, which are the most important, in, in my opinion, of people who have had experiences of, of both. Um, I believe there are some, especially with DMT. Uh, I don't know about ketamine, but from what I remember, and I might be wrong, uh, even if these, these studies might not even be there, but if I remember correctly, there are some, and they do say they are phenomenologically very different, um, despite having similarities. And, and you should look at the work of um, Pascal Emmanuel Michael um, for that, because he does talk about this, and he's right when he says, you know, it's certainly not the case that DMT or ketamine alone cause these experiences, um, or we should say are correlated with these experiences, because it, it, it certainly is more likely, if this is a chemical-based phenomena, that it's an interplay between various chemicals which may be released at the time of death in the brain. However, again, it's never been shown that these chemicals release to the significant dosages that would be necessary to induce hallucinogenic experiences. Um, there is a study with the rats that show a spike in brain activity, etc., and release of, of DMT at the time of death, um, but again, that's never been scaled up to, to the human being. You could infer that it's likely that it, it does take place, but we don't know. We don't have experimental evidence of that, so it's not something we can conclude uh, until that's done. Uh, but again, even if that is the case, we're talking about correlates because we don't really understand what psychoactive drugs actually do. You know, do they do they damage the brain to a level where consciousness becomes very strange and very dreamlike, or do they? Um, as is evidenced with other research, do they kind of limit the brain's activity and let us experience more of reality the way it actually is? I mean, it seems to be, and it's contested. Um, Pascal said to me during during our interview with him, he said that um, the default mode network has significantly less brain activity associated with it under the influence of DMT especially, but other psychedelic drugs. Um, however, that brain activity is hyper-connected amongst other regions of the brain which wouldn't be as connected in, in natural, in, in normal waking consciousness, which could be a, an explanation for these. However, um, a friend of mine who, who also researches this and has look, looked at other papers says that, well, in fact, um, brain activity as a whole across the whole brain is decreased, which doesn't match up to the levels of heightened lucidity that one would experience during these trips or that has been described during these trips so it's more likely that instead of caught the substances causing the um or directly causing the experiences it's that the brain is less filtering of real reality i suppose so i'm not 100 percent sure um i'd like to get pascal and, and this friend of mine kind of in a conversation to discuss that because it's far beyond my ability to to understand i've never really looked at these studies but it'd be interesting to hear exactly what what they say um, because it is very important to understand so you can see here a graph including all types of uh, drugs we use and you can see the ranking um, of all these uh, drugs uh, on the left you can see the lowest similarity uh, and on the right you can see the highest similarity uh, with NDE. And so our su study suggests here that uh, ketamine is actually could be used as a safe and um, as a safe uh, model uh, for NDE phenomenology in laboratory setting. Uh, so we found a very high similarity between ketamine narrative and NDE narrative. And this actually permit us to uh, do the hypothesis that uh, NDE endogenous, uh, NDE antagonism uh, may be released in the proximity of death uh, and triggering uh, an NDE phenomenology. So this kind of study may help us to um, do hypothesis regarding the neurophysiological uh, mechanism underlying and the um and again it's a very reasonable um, hypothesis based on those 
based on those results that ketamine is the most similar to near-death experiences. So the hypothesis that maybe these endogenous drugs are released at death um, to trigger near-death experience phenomena is perfectly reasonable. Um, it wouldn't, of course, necessarily be just one of the drugs, just ketamine that's causing near-death experiences. It could be that a variety of these different drugs are intermingling to create the near-death experience phenomena, um, at least a subjective aspect, because then you've got, I mean, regardless, this is going to be correlatory. You know, near-death experiences occur when ketamine and other experiences are present in the brain. Again, that's not something that's been seen yet, but this is the hypothesis we're working with, as, as Dr. Martial mentions. Um, but again, yeah, it is, it is correlatory. We can't say that these drugs directly cause these experiences, it's just that they are present within them, because as always, we come to the problem of consciousness, the hard problem of consciousness, which is how do how would these drugs, which in themselves are non-conscious matter, interacting with other non-conscious matter, generate the experience of consciousness at all? You know, how, how does the brain, which is again just a variety of non-conscious matter in in very 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 um, very complex forms, but non-conscious at their base, how do they interact to f create consciousness overall? You know, it, it's it's always going to come back to that problem. And most people compare it to something like digestion, which is a concept, and consciousness is a concept which arises from non-conscious matter, same way digestion does. However, um, digestion isn't really an experience. You know, it's a process. It is a physical process, and we can map exactly how it takes place physically. Which you know, by non-conscious matter, we can see the interactions and see how exactly they cause digestion to happen. Um, but we can't do that with consciousness, which is an experience, which is by all means not you know a physical experience as far as we can determine um, there's no mechanism and no understanding of how chemicals and electric signals and um, neurons interact with each other to create this non-physical kind of sensation of, of being so again it all will come back to that and that prevents us from having any kind of causal correlation between things outside of just um, we see this and that seems to relate to this experience in the same time but not necessarily causally we can't really discern that without that mechanism so this was one study and uh, there are other kind of study which uh, investigate the, the similarity uh, and potential difference between ND and psychological drugs. Uh, notably, the Imperial College London um, used DMT to induce uh, similar uh, subjective experience in LC participants. And uh, then we compare their uh, subjective report with classical NDE. And we so DMT is often cited in YouTube comments <laughs> as being the cause of near-death experiences. Um, as we can see here, first of all, near-death experiences are, or sorry, DMT is, um, if we go back, so 50, 36, let's go back to this chart here. One, two, three, four, five. So DMT, 5-MeO-DMT, which is often cited, is the fifth most um, similar experience of drugs to near-death experiences so why dmt is cited as the cause and still I'm, I'm not sure and i've forgotten completely which it was 50 56 wasn't it something like that um but we can see here that although there are distinct similarities especially the bright light as we can see between dmt and near-death experiences the others generally we see there is some slight disconnection in some and very distinct differences in others um, so most notably, um, things we see more in DMT and not so much in near-death experiences are an unearthly environment, heightened senses, um, harmony and unity, um, and very slightly feelings of joy, but that's probably more negligible compared to the others. And things we see more in near-death experiences and not in DMT are, seem to be considerably more um, altered time perception, separation from the body, uh, and well the the last one two three four five six seven the last seven cases the last seven experiences or symptoms rather we see a lot more in near death experiences and not so much in dmt um so of course what you would argue is that those that are similar 
in both DMT and near-death experiences could be causes underlying by DMT and that the differences could be the interplay of other drugs which do result in these phenomena, which is which is fair enough. You could argue that, again, we come back to the hard problem of consciousness overall and the fact that perhaps these drugs, in fact, give us more access to reality and lessen the filtration capabilities of the brain, if you look at it as a filter theory of, of consciousness, um, as opposed to these drugs cause illusions to this regard we don't know it could be either is just as, as likely at this point and some would argue like my friend that because psychedelics reduce overall brain activity allegedly and this is in his opinion that the filter idea is much more parsimonious to the data um but again it's one to make up your own mind with i haven't read the papers i'm not a brain um scientist so i'm not going to tell you exactly what is true and what isn't because i don't know as i say look to pascal michael emmanuel's work on this he is much more knowledgeable about this than i am um, and he's doing a phd in it at the moment which tells you uh, you should listen to to his advice certainly on this subject uh, to um, investigate or a kind of feature uh, typical um, in drug-induced experience and uh, we uh, also observed that the experience of ego dissolution is actually one of the main uh, features of NDE. So, uh, to sum up, there are several studies showing the high similarity between NDE and drug-induced experience. And I really found that interesting because, of course, as a researcher, we are not there when people experience uh, NDE, typical uh, classical NDE. So we can use uh, psychedelic or uh, drugs such as ketamine to induce such a subjective uh, experience. In However, it is difficult to equate similarities with, again, you know, a causation base, even though, you know, of course we can't do that, but to illustrate that point further, um, the experience of asthma, for instance, is very similar to the um, to uh, the experience of pneumonia in terms of the, the subjective experiences, you know, struggling to breathe, tightness of the chest, pain in the chest. Uh, I've had asthma, luckily I haven't had pneumonia, um, but one could argue that because they are so similar in experience and in symptomology, that it's the same underlying um, mechanism that's causing them, however it's not. Because asthma is the um, expansion of the airways effectively in, in the lungs. Pneumonia is uh, the build-up of liquid in the um, bronchioles, is it bronchioles? Of, of, of the air sacs, I suppose, in the in the lungs, which um, prevents oxygen from being passed through the, uh, through the lining into the bloodstream. So although the experience is very similar, the two mechanisms that underlie it are very, very different. Um, as I say, you know, I've had experience with asthma and I ended up in hospital with it, so I know what that feels like and it's not nice. And um, again, from the experiences that I've heard personally and that you see on the news, etc. Of, um, of pneumonia, they are very, very similar, although very different causes. Laboratory setting to uh, study um, the neurobiological mechanism. Here are also a kind of study where we found correlation between uh, a brain region and uh, the occurrence of a subjective experience, uh, such as the sensation of presence. We know that if we stimulate the, the temporoparietal junction, um, the left temporoparietal junction, we can induce the sensation of presence in uh, LC participant. Same for out-of-body experience. Um, in this uh, very uh, interesting study, uh, the reader and colleagues show that if we stimulate uh, this part of the brain, we can uh, clearly uh, induce an out-of-body experience. That was uh, Olaf Blank et al. Yeah, there, 2002. I'm not going to comment too much on it because um, I did for a while believe that it was effectively just that on the stimulation of this brain region it creates like the feeling of your leg being lifted or you sitting up forcefully um but i did like to see after reading a little bit more of the study that they did kind of also induce the feeling of being 
outside of the body from behind the head. So uh, there's clearly more about that study that I don't really understand. However, generally it seems that the key difference between the uh, OLAF study, and I don't know about the hypercapnia and the temporal parietal junction L study, so I won't say much about those. Very interesting, certainly, and worth further research. Um, but in the in the OLAF Blanc junction R study, the key difference, it seemed, was the experience of being forcefully removed from the body um, and kind of the sensations were uncontrolled, whereas in, in traditional out-of-body experiences or I suppose organic out-of-body experiences, one is able to do so at leisure, I suppose, through their own will, through their own choice and can move um, based on their own decision to do so as opposed to being forcefully forcefully done. And again, you know, causing similar experiences through different means does not equate that that is the case for all of these experiences again you know pneumonia and, and asthma are very similar experientially but the underlying cause is a very different so you couldn't say that pneumonia is caused by asthma because they are very similar um, in the same way you can't say that all out-of-body experiences are as a result of temporal parietal junction r stimulation or interference somehow just because we've created similar effects which are phenomenologically it seems different although i'm not going to say that's certain because i don't know enough about the study but um, from what i do know they are phenomenologically different especially in the terms of forced versus kind of through choice and um, those that can come out of body um, at will as i say do so at will and not forced so um although it is true that they can induce similar experiences that doesn't necessarily mean that all experiences are as a result of uh, that physical trigger we also know that uh, in hypercapnia uh, people may report uh, features such as bright light out of body experience or other kind of mystical um, element so actually, all this study uh, helps us to understand the underlying neurophysiological mechanism of NDE. So in a recent publication, with not necessarily the underlying mechanism, the underlying correlations, I would say. With my uh, colleague, we uh, sum up the main mechanism which should underlie uh, NDE like. So uh, just to mention as well, um, an important study that was done regarding the um, oxygen level and um, carbon dioxide level in the blood. It was the blood gases versus near-death experience reports by Grayson and others. Um, they showed no significant um, no significant relationship between the level of oxygen or near-death near -death experience or um, carbon dioxide in the bloodstream um, against near-death experience frequency. People were reporting same you know levels of near-death experience regardless of whether they had more than enough blood in the ox in the in the um, bloodstream more more than enough oxygen in the bloodstream too much oxygen not enough too much carbon dioxide not enough it, it there was no relationship there um i can't remember the name of the study but have a look at that uh, there are studies that argue against that so they're worth looking at as well and compare <coughs> compare the um both authors comments on on each of those studies to to come up to your own conclusion but it would seem initially that blood gases in the in the bloodstream and therefore that are received by the brain do not determine whether an near-death experience is more likely or not. Uh, there is this uh, hypercapnia, but we also know that in syncope, uh, fainting, we can observe uh, NDE like. So we know that the uh, decrease of oxygen may induce. Uh, typical prototypical feature of NDE. As we say, as I said before, uh, some neurotransmitter may be involved. Endorphin may be also uh, released uh, uh, in the proximity of death to induce such uh, intense uh, ex subjective experience. And uh, based on- Induce or correlate with, again. On the recent empirical study, we found a few brain regions that you can see here uh, related to uh, the, um, the occurrence of uh, NDE phenomenology. And in the NDE literature, there is actually uh, a lake of a structure framework 
to analyze uh, and define NDE. So it's why uh, recently with my colleague, we uh, suggested to uh, use these three components uh, to define NDE and compare them with other kind of subjective experience or altered state of consciousness. So we suggested to use wakefulness, internal awareness, so all kind of subjective experience, and connectedness that we define here as the connection to the environment permitting the experience of external stimuli. Wakefulness and internal. So awareness. you can see here many, uh, many states, many, con many conditions. I won't uh, go, um, I won't define them and, and discuss all of them but uh, I will focus here on NDE, but like that you can show how we compare NDE and NDE like with other kind of altered state of consciousness. So if you are awake uh, and in a normal uh, conscious uh, state, all these three components should be relatively high. But I'm not sure on the difference between eternal, internal awareness and wakefulness, because if you're awake, surely internal awareness is, is necessary for that so we'll see by contrast uh on in a coma or uh, general anesthesia without a subjective experience the three components are uh, very low oh so perhaps internal awareness is referring to the state or the experience of being and maybe you know dream states and just the experience of being aware whereas wakefulness is maybe being referred to as the experience of external physical reality you know the real world if you want to call it that perhaps um which would make sense because in coma certainly you have neither um, as far as we know um of course it's not really an experience so it's difficult to say that you don't have an experience of internal awareness because because to experience nothingness isn't an experience so it's difficult to really to say uh, in general anesthesia um, hopefully you're not having any wakefulness <laughs> even though it's shown to the right I mean there are cases of general anesthesia awareness which is unfortunate but generally you don't want to be um, wakeful at all um, of course it is not as deep as, as coma unconsciousness so that's reasonable to put out there uh, non-REM sleep without dream is yeah kind of similar to general anesthesia but not quite as deep uh, near-death experiences there is a heightened level of inter internal awareness however there can also be s more lucid experiences of wakefulness than in normal reality according to the reports um, especially when they are able to see what is taking place in locations far removed from their physical body accurately and report back um, so I'm not sure if that's quite accurate for near-death experiences, whether that should be also kind of stretched um, along the x-axis because you've got um, y, x and, and z. So that should be spread maybe a little bit more to include the um, uh, vertical perception parts, although they are a lot less common. But I would argue much more important than the subjective nature of them. And the near-death-like experience is those experiences that take place very similar to near-death experiences but not near death physically so um so we can't really call them near-death experiences although they are effectively the same experience and for a near-death experience we can observe that uh there is uh, of course the presence of internal awareness so it is a subjective experience that and just to add, I'd be curious as to why near-death experiences are so compact as a po um, compared to near-death-like experiences when we saw earlier on that the similarities between them, hang on, uh, 56.13. When we saw the experiences between them are, are very, 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 very similar indeed, um, except, you know, some very slight differences between non-life-threatening and life-threatening. And yet, if we go back... Uh, I've already forgotten <laughs> what the timestamp was. I'll go back to about there. And yet they are so different in terms of how they reported here. I don't know, it just doesn't make sense to me. That uh, we experience while we are uh, uh, in, a, in, a, you know, sorry, in a condition 
where the, the level of wakefulness is relatively low. So such as cardiac arrest or some TBI, or it can be also under uh, general anesthesia. Also, the drug-induced and psychotic hallucinations, which are um, Dr. Martial was comparing in her um, in her semantic study, are so very similar, especially within ketamine. Uh, and yet, again, they seem to be at total opposite ends of the spectrum, although they both do include a strong level of internal awareness. Um, oh, it's going to be difficult for me to really interpret that that graph accurately because it's, it's, I'm not trained to do so but they look at an initial glance from a lay person they look to be very very different although they have been reported earlier as very very similar maybe it's just the way I'm interpreting the graph incorrectly because there are three axes and, and that kind of goes beyond my <laughs> ability to discern at least visually um, wakefulness yeah, I don't know. Perhaps that's just my interpretation of it, but you would expect they'd be closer, much closer, if not overlapping. Although we do have their ketamine-induced anesthesia, I'm assuming, or un yeah, and it's ketamine-induced anesthesia, which is much closer. So maybe the drug-induced psychotic hallucinations are more kind of generalised across all drugs, which would make sense, I suppose. Etc. For ND like, uh, it is actually a group more heterogeneous. So we can see here that uh, people may report ND like where when they are fully awake, uh, full internal awareness, and a connection to the environment, such as uh, eye uh, fever or anxiety. But we can also observe that ND like are report in other kind of uh, context such as meditation or syncope where actually uh, people are in a, uh, a more critical situation and are less aware of their environment and uh, sometimes not awake. So currently we see that uh, ND may be report from uh, all parts of the world and actually this universality uh, suggests uh, maybe that uh, uh, there is a, a biological uh, origin and purpose of this NDE. So recently okay. with our colleague from uh, Denmark, we uh, suggested the hypothesis that uh, thanatosis, so uh, th uh, that feigning, uh, which is uh, which is a defense uh, mechanism in animal, would could be the ev evolutionary origin of NDE. So uh, we here found that tenetosis uh, occur actually at all major uh, nodes uh, in animal, and we also suggested that uh, the acquisition of language in humans. Let's have a look at what. Is thanatosis, thanatosis, I've never heard of that, playing dead. We have transformed this behavior in a more complex, in a more complex um, uh, experience. So a rich uh, perception that we can now call uh, NDE. And actually we also do the hypothesis, hypo sorry, we also um, hypothesis, hypothesis that uh, NDE may offer um, a more uh, intelligible and less distressing reality when people are close to death or in a situation of danger. So the hypothesis here is that um, NDEs are, do have a biological basis because they are so universally found across the human race. Which is fair enough, absolutely fair enough. However, you are assuming um, initially that these are physical phenomena, which again is very reasonable based on the semantic analysis and the comparison between um, the drug-induced experiences and near-death experiences um, from a subjective point of view. Although, again, there are studies that would suggest um, that perhaps that isn't necessarily a causal relationship. Um, and again, you know, the, the study by 
Grayson et al. Et al. that show the differences in, in blood oxygen levels and carbon dioxide levels, blood gases, don't seem to have an effect on whether near-death experiences occur or not. Um, putting all that aside, you then have the veridical perception, which, in my opinion, is the is the shifter between um, paradigms, because suddenly, once you have that, you have access to this whole other paradigm that consciousness is separate or... Um, in an idealistic model is kind of the ultimate reality which is um, matter is is consciousness as viewed from a third per- or from a disassociated state so effectively consciousness and matter are one thing just from two separate points of, or two separate um, vantage points I suppose suddenly that becomes more likely when we have these critical perceptions because all the evidence is able to fit into or all the rec- all the um, data is able to fit into that paradigm just as easy as it is a physical model um it's just that the physical model is the most commonly the most commonly accepted despite not having that initial necessary mechanism as to how non-conscious matter can create consciousness to me the data is more fitting to a um to a consciousness is filtered through the brain model than it is that the brain creates consciousness um and the universality um the correlations between drug induced hallucinations and near death experiences the fact that near death experiences or near death experiences like experiences take place whether near death or not um they it, all, all the data for that fits into that model of um the brain as a filter or a, a limiter of experience in my opinion um and you certainly can argue that that consciousness can continue without the physical brain taking place or or the physical brain um, being healthy and functioning so it is sorry and to add on to that there are you know near-death experiences aren't the only evidence for this there are many other areas of research into phenomenological consciousness and i suppose paranormal experiences if you want to call it that that also um, support that hypothesis as well so the only real way you can fit all this and say it is only evidence for a physical model is by discounting or ignoring the evidence for other experiences as well as um, veridical perception, just denying that it takes place or saying that it must be wrongly reported or wrongly remembered, etc., etc., or fraudulent, which in my view is a very kind of narrow way of looking at something and is much more ideological than scientific. Uh, the first time we suggest this, uh, this hypothesis, uh, but of course we hear lack of empirical uh, data, um, but we wanted here to discuss more the evolutionary origin of NDE and uh, its potential biological uh, purpose. So uh, here, quickly, um, here are the take-home message, I would say. Uh, so NDE uh, literature is an emerging field of research. I'm very happy to see that more and more uh, researchers are um, motivated to study uh, this uh, fascinating uh, topic. Um, and actually, more and more people contacted us uh, uh, telling us that they experience ND like in many different kind of non-life threatening situations. So I hope here we will have more research in order to better describe those uh, fascinating uh, experience. And so we saw here uh, a few uh, studies trying to reproduce ND like feature in laboratory setting. And I really hope here that uh, this will uh, help the NDE literature to define the underlying mechanism. So based on the, our study, ketamine could be uh, one of uh, the most interesting candidates to model uh, NDE uh, in laboratory setting. Um, and so we just saw uh, our recent hypothesis about uh, potential evolutionary origin of NDE. 
And to conclude, uh, ND can be considered as a state of disconnected consciousness. And uh, I think this uh, state can clearly help to expand our understanding about human consciousness, uh, notably by comparing those uh, experiences to other kind of uh, subjective experience or other kind of alter state of consciousness. Yeah. Um, very reasonable. However, I would be interested in hearing um, Dr. Martial's take on things like evidential mediumship, uh, veridical perception in near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences, uh, past life memories, among others, that would seem to corroborate this evidence in a more, um, I say, brain filter hypothesis as opposed to a brain generation hypothesis. So maybe I'll, if I can find a contact for, for Charlotte, I'll reach out and um, try and get her on the show to see what she see what she thinks about that. So thanks very much for watching. Um, if you have any other videos or articles that you'd like me to give my thoughts on, feel free to drop me an email or reach out to me on the Discord server or on Facebook or anywhere else. Um, there is a new website coming. It probably won't be available once this video is released. I don't know when this video is going to be released. Um, but if it is, you can go to it at seeking-eye.com seeking <clears throat> and contact me through there. Uh, always happy to have a look and, and give you my thoughts on these videos. So thanks very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.